Okay, so this is Michael, the guy behind the Evil GMs, and this is our very versed podcast. I've wanted to do something like this for a really super long time. Yes, I said super, because I am that excited about it. Anyhow, I've wanted to do this for a really, really long time, but I haven't had the technology or something has always seemed to get in the way, so we're going to try it. About a week ago, you may have noticed that there was a Legends and Lore article uh, where they talked about wanting to dramatically change. It was the unification one. They wanted to dramatically change uh, the structure of D&D, how it plays, how it's paced. And they made this comment that flabbergasted a whole bunch of people. However, our standard goal is to remove minimum group sizes, allow for complete adventure in one hour of play, and satisfying campaigns in 50 hours of play. Now, I think it's really cool that they st- took the time to set aside their design philosophy and like have be so very clear about it. That's an exceptionally good thing. The weird thing is is that I don't think anybody, even some of us old-timers, really think of that as what a role-playing game is like. When you think about it, it's like you got all these books and stories, and it takes planning, and it takes preparation, and it's this big, huge thing. And so I think people were confused by that as a philosophy. And it took me a while to wrap my head around it, but there's a theory in game design called abnegation. Now, normally it means... Well, it has a very tactical definition, but when we're in reference to games, what it means is, is abnegation is when you get out of your head. It's the stuff you do so that you don't have to think the way you would if you were at work or, you know, if you're doing something serious. Abnegation is just setting all that aside and having fun. Well, so what they're doing is that they're they're looking at what a game is supposed to do and how it's supposed to feel. And in a rather nostalgic sense, they're going back to, well, how did games used to be? And the truth of the matter is is that when an old school game worked well, it was a lot of fun because you just got together. If you were me, because you weren't old enough to drink, you you drank soda, which was about the only time that you got a chance to. You hung out with your friends for an afternoon and it was, he called it a day. And it wasn't like, yeah, you talked about it outside a game. It was something you did passionately. But it didn't feel like work. It always felt like play. The thing is, is that as time has gone by, role-playing feels less like just going to the movies or going to play pop golf and more like something that you really have to invest in and think about, like joining a bowling league. And there are a couple things that go along with that transition. The first is is that like stuff becomes serious. Like, rules start to matter. Well, I can understand why they want to try for this old-school style of play. And the reason is, is because they're wanting to capture a part of the market that isn't being serviced by role-playing games. And that is the, we're just going to casual slapdash, throw it together, play, haha, have fun, go home. Um, the evolution of games have made it so that people are spending more time, it's more serious, and there's less abnegation. Well, I think this is a good thing. I think this is actually... It, it's one of the more interesting concepts to come out of these articles, because honestly, I haven't liked a lot of what I've seen, because I happen to like 4th edition, and the re- most of the reason that I like 4th edition is because that it took a very practical approach to what does and does not belong in a role-playing game. What they're saying here, though, is, is that... Um, they want to capture a very fun style. And I agree with them. I think part of the problem is is that they've kind of forgotten what some of the bad old things were like, and part of the reason that games evolved, role-playing games changed. And the first one of those is the one we all know. It's Linear Fighter Quadratic Wizard. Okay. Now... They keep referencing this principle, oh, we're going to fix it, oh, we're going to fix it, which, whatever, I'll wait and see. 
But they have already said that as part of their design philosophy that they want different people to be good at different classes, to be different good at different times. And this goes back to an early problem that I used to refer to as banding, which nobody else does, so don't be confused by my use of the term. The idea is, is that in the beginning, like a fighter and a rogue, they're pretty good at what they do. They might actually be masters of the battlefield. They're, they're really strong. But then as the casters gain more and more abilities, and if you follow Monty Cook and his cohort's concept of how story evolves... The, the nature of the campaign changes such that those players and those characters are no longer viable. They get dramatically overshadowed by what the other players can, the other characters can do. Um, you see this most often. I gave that example of the the parties trying to get into a fort, and the fighter says, "Well, I'm going to bend the bars," and the wizard says, "Well, I'll just use passwall." And, you know, the rogue says, well, I'll just sneak in. And the, the wizard says, well, I can just let us fly. And so when one character reaches a point where they can do everything, or close enough to everything, um, that becomes a serious, serious problem. Now, the evolution of role-playing games has been that no player gets to dominate the table. That's, that's been one of the defining movements over all the decades of role-playing games. And that's a really strong concept, because the moment that someone feels like their character is useless, it's gone beyond they're having less fun, or maybe they're even having no fun. That engenders a specific kind of frustration with the game, um, and it makes people walk away from games. Uh, when somebody can just say no, and this is especially true when characters are fighting amongst themselves. Um, if one player can simply go, well, either do what I say or I'll kill your character, that creates a toxin. It's poisonous to your table. And it's, it's part of the reason that people stop playing, is because they realize, they understand that fundamental unfairness, or that that quintessential imbalance, that they're no longer as relevant or important to the story, at least in the ways that matter to them. I mean, you can artificially inflate someone, but that's not always effective as a as a tactic. The other big problem with old school role playing, um, and it's one that people tend to try and really, really gloss over is the mother may I problem. Now running a role playing game is, in a lot of ways, it's like running a sophisticated version of Cowboys and Indians. I mean, at the end of the day, the GM could do pretty much whatever they want. And the hope is, is that the GM will want to do things that are good for everyone. But this hasn't always been true. And as much as um, the people at Watsi have have tried to gloss over this this very very simple truth, you can't escape it. Is is that on some level, almost every GM does stupid, imbalanced, unfair things. I'm guilty of it. Every GM I've ever seen has been guilty of it. Now, whether or not those things get out of control, whether they have a a permanent damaging effect on their game, that's a different issue entirely. But the evolution of rules has to a certain degree been a bulwark against that mother may I mentality getting out of hand. Now one of the more interesting discussions for me is whether or not rules have actually been especially effective at fixing both of these problems. I think when it comes to a linear fighter quadratic wizard, the answer is a resounding yes. Um, the cost in 4th edition for wizards and clerics to not completely overpower fighters and rogues may or may not be too high, but at the very least, it has been effective in preventing that specific problem. When it comes to Mother May I, when it comes to shielding the players from the GM themselves, that's an entirely different conversation, 
it's difficult to say that rules have been effective in preventing GMs from being douchebags. It's very possible that the people at Wizards are correct that nothing will prevent jerks from being jerks, or that nothing you do will lessen the probability that they'll be a jerk, and that proper game design actually means giving tools to the GMs who will use them appropriately and acknowledging that there will always be a certain percentage that abuse them. And you, because you can't do anything about it, you might as well not even bother to try. I don't know how much I like that because I've seen an awful lot of games and an awful lot of people end up unhappy because people couldn't help being jerks. Now, if we're going to be fair, we have to admit that the problems haven't always been on the GM side of the table. Um, it is true that there is a certain mindset in 4th edition that the player can say, that's not fair, or they can demand that things work or turn out in specific ways. And I will grant that that byproduct of balancing has been uncomfortable for many GMs to deal with um, because it fundamentally challenges their ability to tell a story and it challenges their sense that they are imminently fair. I mean, most of us as GMs like to think of ourselves as being as neutral as is appropriate. Um, to strike that balance between simulation and fun. Um, but interestingly enough, I think that it's equally true that in 3.5 there was actually much greater pressure on GMs to accept, admit, and tolerate things that were probably bad for the table. I know that while I was running 3.5 there were many times when there were things in books that I didn't think were good. Um, I remember that there were a number of feats that just drove me crazy. Um, but at the same time, because all of this stuff was sanctioned material, there was this tremendous pressure to permit it and have it work the way it worked in the book. Um, so that this idea that um, GMs are being hamstrung by um, the player's expectations of the rules is hardly new. Um, it's I think it's good and healthy that we're having this discussion about next, about um, the way that affects the table and the GM's ability to do their job, because um, let's be honest, it has in the past been a fairly serious problem. So if a vastly simplified rule set can serve the dual purposes of allowing people to get out of their heads and to relax and just have fun and to endorse a more open freewheeling cinematic playstyle then you can definitely count me in I think however that this is going to be far more complicated than any of the people at Wizards have been willing to credit it for thus far um, we've spent a generation or more of gamers teaching players that mechanics, rules, these things matter, and that um, they have certain expectations. Um, and it doesn't help that video games have taught me much th them much the same thing, that, that there, are, there are rules and things that they can rely on. Because it's a very comforting thing to be able to have something that you can say that this will always work and you can't take this away from me. And one of the hallmarks of that high narrative style, though, is, is that like, pretty much anything can happen because it's really only limited by your imagination, the GM's imagination, and what the GM will accept as appropriate. I, I hope it works out. I, I think that it's an interesting discussion to have. Um, and I think I'm going to leave it there. So... Thanks for listening to our first podcast. Um, I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed making it. Uh, it, it definitely was a different experience to hear my voice um, 
recorded like this. So have a good evening, and I'll talk to you later.